John chapter 12, verse 20 to verse 26 for our reading today. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered, and this is going to be the focus of our sermon today. The hour has come. The Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But... If it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father or her will honor. Just again, to tag the text, is already, the subject has already been given to us in the passage, we wish to see Jesus. You may be seated. We wish to see Jesus. Um, most parents, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who uh, husbands and wives or mothers and fathers who have uh, had this experience would know these two words, Braxton Hicks. Braxton Hicks is a commonly known thing whereby a woman who is pregnant begins to experience what she believes to be labor pains. Um, they gave it the name Braxton Hicks because what they determined is that it was a false reading in terms of what a woman's body is going through. So they just styled it Braxton Hicks, suggesting that it was false pains. It was not the real thing because they would literally say, your time is not yet. Uh, there are things that are going on anatomically with the woman that would suggest that there is a false reading in the body that is saying maybe the baby needs to come, but not at this particular time. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in his ministry, went through some seasons whereby people thought his hour had come. But throughout his ministry, he reminded them over and over again, my hour is not yet come. But today when we look at the text that we are observing all throughout the book of John, all throughout the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there came a time that Jesus' hour finally arrived. It was no longer a Braxton Hicks situation. It was no longer a false reading. It was no longer a, a, a a possibility that he was about to do what he was going to do. He had now come to do what God had assigned him to do. And of course, when we think of our Lord, we know he did some wonderful things. He healed the sick and he raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He caused lame people to walk and those who could not speak, he gave them the ability to speak. He cast out demons. He restored so many with various diseases and the like. He even, he even healed a man that was born blind. But ultimately, his purpose for coming was to die for your sins. It was to die for our sins. It was to die for my sins. So along the way, he taught us wonderful principles of God. He taught us, taught us wonderful teachings of the Father. He taught us about the kingdom of God and how God wants us to live within that kingdom. But all of that was important. Because his hour had finally come. Yeah. And so when we read our text today, we, we see that, 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 that trip that Jesus now is taking to Jerusalem. He is on that road to the cross. He is on that road to Calvary. He is on that road to Golgotha. He's on that road uh, to the place called the Skull Hill. And while he is there, because of who he is, he continues to teach us principles of the kingdom. The Bible says that it, it, is, it is the feast 
of the Passover. You would read that in chapter 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. The reason that they would gather at the Passover, you remember, you recall uh, in the scripture, the Bible would, would remind us in the book of Leviticus, or actually in the book of Exodus, it would remind us in Exodus 3, 23, that there were three times a year that all males were to tr return to Jerusalem in celebration of three very various feasts. It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover. Uh, you would see that in verse 15 of chapter 23. It was that God, they would commemorate the fact that God brought them out of Egypt. They would celebrate the harvest of the first fruits. In other words, the first of the fruits and vegetables that would actually grow as a result of God's goodness. They would bring those first fruits to represent the fact that they were appreciative to God, and then that was the fruit, the time of the end gathering. In other words, it was at the end of the cropping season, it was at the end of the time when they brought in all of the fruit and vegetables, and they would go back to the city again, and then they would commemorate the fact that God had been good to them throughout that year of harvest. So in this case, there was the feast of the Passover whereby the children of Israel were commemorating the fact that God had brought them out of bondage in Egypt and he had led them into the promised land. And so while there, the Bible says that there came Greeks, certain Greeks among them. And here was the wonderful thing is that when you had the religious people, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, you had the religious people who were plotting to kill Jesus. You had Greeks who had believed, and we say Greeks, we would believe that these were not necessarily Jews. They were proselytes who had come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, much like about the man that we read in Acts chapter 8 uh, that came all the way from, from Ethiopia, and he was ultimately baptized by Philip. There were people who were not Jews who came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here was a Greek, Greek people who said, sir, we would see Jesus. In other words, what they were saying, we wish to see him. We, we desire to see him. We want to see him. It is our purpose to see him. Even though there's a group that want to kill him, there's a group that wants to see him. There's a group that wants to destroy him. There's another group that wants to lay eyes on him. There's a group that wants to get do wicked things to him. There's another group that comes to worship him. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So the Bible says that Philip came and he told Andrew and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And, and you would think at that point that Jesus is going through a situation where he knows that they're plotting to kill him. He knows that his time is very, very short. He knows that they don't like him. He knows that they care nothing about him. And to think that there was somebody who would say, sir, we would see Jesus. You would think that Jesus would say, hey, bring him in. Because right now I know what's headed for. I know what I'm headed for. I know what's coming. I know what's on the horizon. I know what the religious folk are doing. I know what the high priests are planning. I know what the Sadducees got in mind. I know what the Pharisees want to do to me. I know what the scribes are saying to the people. So bring them in. But the Bible says, and that's the contrast, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, the hour has come. The hour has finally come. In John chapter 2, you remember when he changed water to wine, when, 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 when his mama said to him, Sir, uh, son, they have, no, they, have no, they have no wine. Jesus turns to his mom and he says, my, my hour is not yet come. He says it again in John chapter 7 around verse 30, that, that, that my hour is not yet come. He says it again in John chapter 8 verse 20, my hour has not yet come. And many times he said that made those statements around various feasts where many people were gathering for the purpose of celebration and because there were a lot of people in Jerusalem at that particular time. But he would remind them over and over, my hour is not yet come. But after raising Lazarus from the dead, and giving a preview of what was coming for all believers. The Bible says, he declares, my hour, my hour has come. Watch this. That the Son of Man should be glorified. And of course, you know, when the time we look at that word glorified, he says should be. And again, that's the subjunctive suggestion. This is what should happen for him. This 
what is what must happen. This is what could happen for him. It is, it is in a sense, this is what must be done in order for there to be some other results as a result of what he will do. And it says, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And you would think, you would think he was glorified. You would think he was glorified when he changed water to wine. Yeah, you would think, you would think he was glorified when he, when he, when he heals a, a, a man's son long distance that wasn't nowhere around and said, to say to him, your son is well. You would think he was glorified when he healed that man that had been sick for 38 years and told him to lift up his bed and walk. You would think he was glorified when he, he, when he, when he calls 5,000 people to be fed with two fish and five barley loaves. You would think he was glorified when he cause a man born blind to see. You would think he was glorified when he caused Lazarus to be raised from the dead. But Jesus said, now is the time that the Son of Man must be glorified. And, and, and Lord, and most of the time, folk, you know, you think about it. When you think about uh, glorification, that is the idea of praise, and that's the idea of bestowing honor and dignity. And most of the time, when you think of those things, normally it would be that good things are getting ready to happen to somebody. Can I get a witness in here? That people are honored at anniversaries. People are honored at various awards uh, assemblies. People are, are honored by their jobs for well, some, something that they accomplish on their job. And so you see honor, and normally honor has with it a positive connotation. But Jesus would say to us, if you want to see God in all of his glory, you're going to have to see God in all of the glory that man could ever portray, that man could ever demonstrate. And here it is. Jesus begins to unpack when he says, sir, we wish to see Jesus. He helps them now to understand how do you really see Jesus in all of his glory. How do, you, how do you see that expression of the son of man, the one who gives life, the one who extends life, the son of man, God, who I now identifies himself with humanity. You know, every time I make that statement, I am absolutely amazed at that because when you think of Greek mythology, the goal was always that a human being would become a god, but in our case, we got God becoming a man. And he didn't just become any man. He became a servant. He became a suffering servant. He put himself at the lowest of the lowest of the lowest. Here's the time now that the Son of Man might be glorified. Well, how is he going to glorify? How do, we, how, do we, how do we wish to see Jesus? How do you want to see Jesus? Listen, the only right way to see him is the way he describes himself. The only right way to see him is the way he presents himself. The only right way to see him is the way that he wants us to see him. And one of the first things that he says, if we're going to see, we, sir, we wish to see Jesus, we, we, we see him, first of all, his, his sacrifice produces life. We see that his sacrifice produces life. And, and, and notice in the text, it will show us two things in verse 23. Uh, if, first of all, there's the implication of no production. But that's also the implication of much production. The implication of no production, but that's the implication of, watch this, of much production. Look at verse 23. It says, but Jesus answered them saying, the, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So now, most assuredly, truly, 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 truly. Jesus is saying, what I'm getting ready to tell you is the absolute truth. No debate, no discussion, no delay. It is the absolute truth. Truly, truly, assuredly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So now he's talking about where he's headed. What's going to glorify him most is his sacrifice produces life. Notice what he says. If you take, he, he, Jesus now uses an agrarian term. He uses a, a, a farming term. He says if you got one seed, and if you put that seed on something above the ground and just let that seed sit there, that seed will stand alone. It'll do nothing. It has actually, actually been proven that, you know, Egyptians were, were big on, on harvesting and protecting and all of that sort of thing. One of the things that has been discovered is that in some of the various tombs and, and, and the likes that they have, that they actually have put seeds in those, and those seeds were actually, you could see it was a seed. Some cases, four or 5,000 years, but it did nothing. Why? Because it was never put in the ground. Yeah. 
So what Jesus now is giving an illusion, he's giving the implication of what will happen when he dies. In other words, if I don't die, watch this, I stand alone as I am. Because there's nobody like me. There's nobody that the Father loves like me. There's nobody that can do what I am able to do. There's nobody that can be bestowed the honor that the Father will bestow on me. He says, but if that seed dies, help me, y'all. If a seed dies and it's put in the ground and it dies, it has the potential to produce a whole lot of fruit. So Jesus is saying, if I stay here like I am, if I stay here like I am, if I just stay here like I am, it's going to benefit folk that can't walk and folk that can't talk. But here's the reality. They could still be in their sins. It, 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 it helps some folk that can get, be raised from the dead, but they could still be in their sins. So I got to die. And if I die, there is now the potential that a Timothy Johnson can be productive. There's the potential that a Kelly Jason can be productive. There's, a, there's, a, there's an implication now that a Casey can be productive. There's an implication that a Keith can be productive. There's an impl- in, indication now that those that will believe in me can become more than what they are. But I got to die. If I remain the way I am, if I stay the way I am, Donna don't have a chance. If I stay the way that I am, Helen don't have a chance. If I stay the way that I am, Pat don't have a chance. But oh, if I die. I got to ask you, y'all, aren't you glad he died, aren't you? Aren't you glad that Jesus died? And the Bible says he died for once. He died once for all. His death. Thank you, God. His death, only his death. And, 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 and y'all, y'all notice, y'all notice, y'all notice Ed got excited when he started singing. He rose up and he, and, and he went to preaching for a little while. He said, Abraham died, but he's still dead. You heard him, Isaac died, he's still dead. All of them died, but, but, but watch this. Because Jesus died, watch this, his death now applies. To Abraham, who was 2,000 years before Jesus came. His death applies to Isaiah, who was 700 years before he came. His death applies to Daniel, 400 years before he, he, his death applies to all. So if I die, there's no produce. There's no production. But if if I don't die, there's no production. But if I die, there's much Production. And when I look in this audience right now, when I look at, at this congregation right now, I recognize that all of us are beneficiaries of his death. Because he died now, we can produce some productive lives. Because, we, because he died now, we can live a life that is pleasing to the Father because he died. So secondly, well, again, remember what Jesus said when I, when I said the thing about uh, uh, much production. One, one verse for you to be re- remembered. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief does not come to, uh, to accept to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I came, what, that you may have life, and that you have it, what, more? More abundantly. Here's the second thing. His selfishness, his selflessness, I'm sorry, his selflessness perpetuates life. His selflessness perpetuates life. In other words, here's two things happening in the text. One is life loss, life Life of the li- life of loss, and the other is a life of longevity, a life of loss and a life of longevity. Notice verse twenty-five: He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Notice again, verse twenty-five: He who loves his life will lose it, but he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So think about this. We all come to the world. We all come with a slant, right? We all come thinking like Adam, right? And and when you think of Adam, you think of Eve, the Bible says what what does sin look like? Remember when Eve when Eve uh, uh, saw the tree? The Bible says she thought it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was desirable to make one wise. So what's, what's in the flesh? Y'all, y'all know what the flesh wants, right? Come on, help me, y'all. 
Don't, don't let me feel like I'm by myself. I think y'all flesh still wants some stuff it ain't supposed to want, right? All right, all right. Oh, now y'all got it, y'all got it. It wants some stuff that ain't supposed to want. It's, it wants some stuff it don't need. It wants some things it ain't supposed to have. But it wants it. And it wants it. As a matter of fact, when you go to Galatians chapter 5, there are 23 things that he lists. And then he says, just in case somebody would say, I'm not on that list, it says, and the like. Just to make sure that it's include everybody. 23, 24, 25 things that the flesh wants. Can I get a witness in here? So what he's saying, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. I don't know who I'm talking to in here today. There may be somebody in here who has not trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I'm saying to you, brother, sister, whoever you are, if you are holding on to this life, God is saying ultimately it's going to be destroyed. It's going to come to ruin. It's going to come to nothing. You can't love this life. Sean said it in his prayer. We live in a world that's fallen. We live in a world that's towed up. We live in a world that want what it wants. And if you notice, no matter how much the flesh get, it never stops wanting it. Can I get somebody to help me in here? And so when we are so in love with the world and the creature comforts of the world, the products of the world, the things that the world has to offer, the people that the world has to give, he said you got to be careful about loving this life. There's anybody in here, I don't know if you say, I mean, that, that, that somebody in here that may not have trusted in Jesus and you live in life talking about I'm doing me. Yeah, and you love yourself better than you love yourself. And you all about yourself, whatever it is yourself can have, that's what you want to give yourself. And you be talking to yourself and you say to yourself, look at me. I'm all of that plus a bag of chips and some soda water and a Snickers bar on the side. Just look at me. Aren't I something? Aren't I special? It, it, ain't nobody in the world like me. I'm telling you, if you love you like that, God say, that's going to come a time. Can I get a witness in here? I'm, I'm looking at some young folk in here. Man, y'all fine. I'm talking about handsome. Got vigor, vitality, y'all just as strong as y'all can be right now. Y'all can run all day long and I mean, don't hardly, don't hardly breathe hard. But I'm telling you, brother or sister, boo or honey, I don't care who you are, life going to change. And you can enjoy life all you want right now. Do what you want to do for you right now. But I guarantee you it's going to come a time. It won't be that you ain't doing what you're doing. It's going to be because you can't do what you're doing. Life will make a change. And God is saying, if you love yourself and you love this life so much, you're going to lose it. It will come to ruin. It will come to nothing. It will ultimately fade away. Ah. You, you, remember, you remember Jesus tells the parable of a man? Dude, dude was rich. Had a big bone. And he and he and he look he look and whatever the mirrors look like back in those days. He look in that mirror one day and he say, "Look at me, man! I got all of this going on. I got all these cars, and all this cash, and all this commodity." And he went to talking to himself. He said, "So, you know what we gonna do? We gonna eat, we gonna drink, and we gonna party like it's 1999, and ain't nobody gonna stop us." Bible say that night, the Lord say, you fool, you fool, your soul will be required of you. Now, in, in almost 29 years of service, I've done a lot of services, funerals, I've done a lot of funerals. Now I know, I know some stuff, or some folk put some stuff in that coffin that I told them, don't do that. Don't put that in there. You need to sell that. If it's, if it's so sentimental, you need to keep that, but don't put that in the ground. I had another reason. Because you, 
might think you're, you're going to be the last one to look at that body, but you might not be. So I don't know how much that diamond ring costs, but don't put that in the grave because it ain't going with them. Can I get a witness in here? And the one thing I do know, never saw a U-Haul. Never been hooked up to the hearse. Two things gonna happen. God gonna take you from it or he gonna take it from you. Your soul is the only thing that's going back to the Lord. So Jesus is demonstrating. Jesus is showing. There's loss of life or there's, life, there's the life of loss or there's the life of longevity. Now here's the reality. You're gonna live forever somewhere. You're gonna live forever somewhere. So notice again what he's saying. He says, if anyone, watch this, and, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Listen, folk, you know, we read the word of God. When you read the word of God, you study the word of God, you look at yourself, you look at your, your fleshliness, and you read the word of God. Doesn't it make you cringe sometimes? And I guess I'm at a point in life now that some things that I used to look back on my life that I laughed at, I actually thought it was cool. When I look back on those things now, I actually be shamed. I say, watch this, I actually did that before God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I did that before the God who holds my life. I did what I did in his face, unembarrassed, not shamed, didn't care that he saw me. Now, I did well making sure y'all didn't see me. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? But I didn't care the one that can give me life. If you see me, all you can do is talk about me. He could have seen me and killed me on the spot. But he spared my life. Now, I'm, I hate that stuff that I used to brag on, that stuff that I thought was cool. I thought that, you know, yeah, I'm a man and I'm, I'm all of that. But I look back on that and I'm embarrassed by it. What the Lord said, you got to hate this life. This life brings you trouble. It brings you trial. It brings you grief. It brings you sorrow. But when you love, you know, the Bible says the love of money, what? Is the root of all sorts of evil. You got to be careful about how much you love money because money will get you all twisted up, man. That you forget about God and you start just loving the stuff that God made. And it doesn't matter how much more stuff you get that God made. You'll never be satisfied with the stuff God made. But oh, when you make up your mind to love the one who gave it. Have I got a witness in here? When you love the one who made it, when you love the creator for who he is, that even when you don't have the stuff, you still feel rich. You still feel blessed. You still know that you got it going on. You're still thankful. You're still healthy. You're still grateful for all that God does for you. His selflessness perpetuates life, whether it's life of loss or life of longevity. His last thing, his service proves life. His sacrifice produces life. Uh, his, his, his selflessness perpetuates life. And his service pr proves life. Two ways he does it. Service, first of all, guarantees his presence. Look at verse, look at verse 26. And we're about done. If anyone serves me, let him what? Follow me. Jesus said, if you're going to minister, if you're going to serve, if you're going to help, if you're going to aid, if you're going to assist, if you're going to, you're going to, you're going to bless somebody else. He says, if anyone serves me, let him do what? Let him follow me. Now, when he uses that word follow me, he means to be obedient to him. If anyone serves me, you cannot, you can't serve Jesus and not be obedient to him. You can't serve God and, and not be obedient to him. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So how, do we, how are we going to see him? We got to see. When, when we serve him, his service proves life. Service to him proves life. Service that we render to him, it proves that we're really living. Notice again, it says his service guarantees his presence. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Now, that's good news, y'all. What that says to us, that when we're serving him, no matter where he sends us, he's always with us. Oh, let, me, let me help some Christians. Just maybe one Christian in here tonight or today. Don't, don't worry about night. He, he's in it. 
I hear some people say, I don't go out in the dark. He's in it. Can I get away? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because see, cause see, light don't protect you more. I think, I think we convince ourselves we can see the danger faster in the light. But the reality is, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, when we're serving him, he's with us. Yeah, if you got to come out late at night, he's with you. When, when, when you're serving, you got to go see about somebody, hospital late at night, he's, he's with you. Don't, listen, don't, 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 count on, don't count on anybody else other than him. Serving him, following him, being obedient to him. Sometimes he will take you places you don't want to go. But he gives you the guarantee when you go. As a matter of fact, not, not, matter of fact, I'm right there. I'm, I'm right there. I'm right there. You know, I mean, I mean that, that sometimes we've gotten, you know, we've gotten calls late, late in the morning, early in the morning of death or somebody, somebody sick or whatever. And, uh, you know, and I just, I thank God so much for my wonderful wife. I thank God so much for Marcy that, that through the years, you know, she, she, you know, she, 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 she hear me get up and she sleep. And she go to sleep and she be sleeping solid. And I love that. When it's time for me to go, I give her a kiss, say, hey, I'm gone. She say, okay, be a blessing. But she's not worried about. She don't, she don't have to say to me, you know, watch out for the calls. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. Because we already know the Lord is with us. Can I get a witness in here? And one of the things we got to recognize as believers, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're never by ourselves. Oh, Lord, there are times that, yes, we feel lonely, but you got to know you are never alone. I didn't say you wouldn't feel lonely sometimes because human, human presence and hu- absence of human presence can make you feel lonely. But you got to know that you are never alone. As a matter of fact, you got God with you. And if God is with you, that means three persons, at least three others are with you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, if you serve me. Follow me. Be obedient to me. And I promise, you, you will always know my presence. But listen for what I learned, what I learned. When I'm not where I ought to be, that's when I get scared. But when I'm where God want me to be, that's a boldness, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can be assured of wherever you are that the Lord is with you. Yeah. Yeah, we're praying right now. We're praying right now. My dad is here today. We're praying right now. Uh, he's supposed to have heart surgery on, on Wednesday. We're praying right now that they do some tests tomorrow. When they do those tests, they're going to say, Miss Skinner, we, don't, we know what we thought we saw, but we ain't seen nothing. That's what we're praying for right now. That's what we're praying for right now. But we got confidence in knowing that if he had to go through that surgery, if they got to do something with his heart on Wednesday morning, we got confidence to know that the Lord is in that room with him. Can I get a witness in here? The Lord's presence is always there when we're doing his service. His service guarantees his presence. And here's the final thing. His service guarantees his provision. Notice again, verse, the end of verse 26. He says, he says, if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. Him, my father will honor him. Her, my father. Ooh, wee. You would think, you would think, you would think. Since God put this thing together, and it was man that sinned in the garden. Again, there's verse 26. I'm sorry, in verse 26. Anyone who serves me, let him, let him follow me. In the, the verse says, if anyone serves me, my father will, uh, him my father will honor. Watch this, watch this, watch this. We're the ones that messed up in the garden. Would y'all agree? Now God, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm kind of thinking anthropologically, like a man now, a human being. You know, we messed up, so God said, okay, all right, I'm going to give y'all one chance. I'm going to give you one chance. You were in that garden. You had everything you needed. All the fruit you could have ate, you didn't have to sweat. I told you to tend the garden, but you had to sweat. You had to do nothing. Didn't need no deodorant for steak or nothing like that. You were, you were good. You are perfect, right? Huh? But watch this. I'm going to give y'all one chance. If you mess up again, what I told you, you will surely die. You're going to die, and you're going to stay there. Seemed like to me. Yeah. Yeah. Seemed like it could have been a good deal. Man messed up. God said, okay, all right, all right, you messed up, but I'm going to give you this one chance. But after, you can't blow this one chance. It's all over. 
something that would have been fair, right? But look at what he do. He actually get us out of the garden. Then the Bible says he put an angel in the front so we wouldn't go back in the garden and make it worse. Right? All right. He let us be born. And all of us know since we've been adults, all of us adults in here, how many, how many, how many other chances have you had? I didn't say second chance, other chance. Other, 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 other. I can say that until this time next week and still probably will not exhaust how many chances I've been given. Amen? And he gives us another chance on top of that, right? All right, all right, all right. Now watch this. To me, he could have just said, okay, y'all messed up. Y'all on y'all own. But I will, I guess what? I'm going to give y'all another chance. However, I want y'all to serve me. And at the end of y'all, the time that y'all serve me, um, I want y'all to do what y'all supposed to do. But then right there, it's over. It's, it's just done. Uh, y'all serve me. Y'all help a lot of people. And that's what I wanted y'all to do. Y'all preach some messages and people were, were, were encouraged and they felt good and all of that. But that's going to be it. I'm going to give y'all a plenty of chances. But that's it. Could have done that. But no. What did he do? He said, guess what? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. That that way I am, there you going to be also. In other words, you done messed up in the garden, but guess what? I'm going to bless you in the heaven. Can y'all hear what I'm saying? You messed up in the garden, but in turn, I'm going to let you get to my heaven. Now watch this. You would think when we talk about serving him, he ought to just have us to serve, and we should get nothing for it because we messed up in the garden. In other words, the work we do should be paying for the fact we messed up. But by his grace, by his grace he gives us the ability to serve he gives us the Holy Spirit he gives us the word he put us in the church he gave us pastors he gives us teachers he gives us parents he's given us everything we need to be able to accomplish the work that he wants us to do and then bless my bone he turn around and say and guess what I'm going to do I'm going to reward you for your work Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I'm going to reward you. Now watch this. Here's here's, here's the reality. Here's the reality. In order for us to get the reward, he had to die. Oh yeah, he he had to die. He he had to die. Oh yeah, I got a few more minutes. He had to die. So so think about that. He he had to die. And y'all... Y'all, y'all, remember, y'all remember some of the stuff that happened that Friday evening? The Bible says they, they, uh, they, they whipped him, or they beat him, they, and, they, and, they watched, and they put a crown of thorns on his head. Now when, now, when they, now, when they put that crown of thorns on his head, understand, these were not, these were serious thorns. And they pushed it. Hard. Shot it down on his head. So he wore a crown of thorns. But guess what? He says if I serve him, the father will honor us with some crowns. Guess, watch this. Not just do I give you the work to do and give you the ability to do the work, but even though you don't deserve it, I'm actually going to give you crowns for the work. What I, what I want to say to one person in here, don't, 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 don't be like what Marcia says. Don't be, don't be in heaven a bald head Christian. It, do, it doesn't make sense for him to give his life. It doesn't make sense for him to give the sacrifice that he made. And then we turn around and give him nothing in return. Serving the Lord will pay off. I started to say after a while, but it pays off right now. Can, can I get a witness in here? When you're giving him all you got right now, that's something joyous about that. When you're giving him all you got right now, that's something rewarding about that. Doesn't it make you feel good to help somebody else? Doesn't you get joy in your heart to be a blessing to somebody else? If you're not, I'm saying, come on with it. There's nothing like serving somebody else. There's nothing.
nothing like blessing somebody else that can give your joy, your heart, the fullness of joy that God wants to give. So he promised there's going to be some crowns. He said that's going to be the crown of joy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. He said that's the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. He said that's the crown of life. James 1, verse 12. He said that's the crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, verse 4. And then he says that's the imperishable crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. What I'm trying to tell you, the Lord says, I will provide. Because when it's all over, payday is certainly coming. I, I don't know about you all, but I'm waiting on payday. Yeah, that's something about knowing when you're giving it all that you have. That's something about knowing when you serve as best as you can. To know that the God of grace has promised payday is coming after a while. Have I got a witness, y'all? So when I think about payday over there, and I think about the joy I got over here, the love I got over here, the peace, the, yeah, the long suffering, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control of the Holy Spirit. When I think about how much joy we get in Jesus right now, to know that there will come a day, joy, unspeakable joy, because when we have done the best we can, my Lord, when we've labored in the heat of the day, yeah, when we've gone when we didn't feel like going, and when we did what we didn't really feel like doing, but we did it because the Lord says, I got a crown waiting for you. I gotta ask you right now, how many of y'all like payday right now? you work 40 hours, 80 hours, don't you enjoy payday? I want you to know what you're getting right now is nothing compared to what the Lord has for you. The Lord said payday is coming after a while. He had the crown of God, but we won't have to worry.
over to the day that not only do I see him in his sacrifice, not only do I see him in his selflessness, not only do I see him in his service, but I want to see him in all of his sovereignty. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Won't you tell a neighbor, I wish to see Jesus. Yeah, I wish to see Jesus. I, I look forward, I look forward. I, I see him what he is right now, but I wish, I wish to see Jesus. Father, how we love you and thank you for knowing that you've given us a blueprint. You've given us the portrait. You've given us the design of what it means to see Jesus. We're very fortunate, Lord. Six billion people on planet Earth on Antarctica and Australia and Asia and Africa. North America, South America. God, we, in Europe, we wish to see Jesus for who he really is. And so we, we thank you. Six billion people on planet Earth right now, you are allowing us to see your son for who he really is. Not, not some kind of a once a year Santa Claus that shows up to give us stuff but a Lord who gives us life. And we thank you for Jesus. God, we know how undeserving we are. We know it's only by your grace that we have what we have. But Lord, in the midst of it all, we say thank you. Because you allow us to see Jesus. And then Lord, just like those Greeks, we don't know if they heard what he said. We don't know if they got the answer. But thank you that went to that cross. He did die. And he did get up Sunday morning with all power and all authority. So Lord, we would hope that they saw him just as you allowed us to see him. And there was another that, Lord, help us not to be selfish. Help us not to be self-centered. But to recognize it is in our service that we best demonstrate the proof of life that we have because of Jesus Christ. Now to you, Lord, who's able. We ask again that you would open the hearts and minds of somebody here today who may not know you, somebody who not trusted you, someone who doesn't know you as their Savior, someone who's not allowing you to be their Lord. Speak to their heart now. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. I'm going to ask our leaders to come, those servant leaders that can come comfortably if you don't have to cross over anyone for us, if you would do that. Maybe just stand where you are, otherwise... today, if there is one person in here who hasn't trusted Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. This is your minute. This, yeah, yeah. this has been designed with you in mind. Whoever you are, man, woman, boy, girl, here is your opportunity to trust Christ as your Savior. You can, you can do it today. You can do it right now. You can yeah. do it right now. He, he wants to change the course of your life. He wants to change the character of your life. He wants to actually give you a new life. As a matter of fact, Jesus would say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things, whatever came from Adam, have become. But all things now have become new. And that's what he wants you to trust, that he can give you a new life. And I know there's some saints in here that would agree it is a wonderful life. Oh, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to know Jesus. Oh, yeah, it's a wonderful thing to know Jesus, to have him as your Savior to allow him to be the Lord of your life. So if that describes you today, stand where you are. Come if you choose. We would love for you to be part of the body of Christ. And you may be asking again, Lee, what do I need to believe? Reverend Skinner, what do I need to believe? You need to believe three things. He died. He died for your sins. The sins that were committed in Adam were sins that all of us commit. But God made the promise that he would give us eternal life if we would believe in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we believe. We believe what the gospel teaches us. Or we believe, again, what the Bible teaches us about Jesus. That he's the only way, right way to God. And salvation can come no other way other than through Jesus Christ. And so we believe that with everything that is in us. So if you can believe that today, the Bible says you can be saved. Your life can literally change right here, right now. You can be saved if you would trust him today. 
believe that he died, believe that he was buried, and believe that God raised him from the dead. And you would ask the question, why raise him from the dead? Why is that so important? It gives you a life of hope. Because listen, when we say coming to Jesus, it doesn't mean that you're coming to be problem free. Can I get some saints to help me? It doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials. But what it does say is that he equips you to look at them totally different. You handle them totally different. Rather than complaining, you still give him praise. Rather than throwing in the towel, you say, hey, I'm going to press on another day. Because that's what Jesus will do for you. And when you trust him like that, he's made the promise. Here's another thing that comes along with him. He promises you eternal life, that you're going to live with him forever, trouble free. Did y'all hear what I said? Trouble free. No disease, no sickness, no illness, no pain, no sorrow. That's the promise that he makes. So you got to decide whether it's going to be no more or if you don't trust him, it's going to be a lot more. Yeah. Our former pastor, Dr. Anderson Wilson, used to say it this way. Hell is a place you can check in, but you can't check out. It's quite hot, quite uncomfortable, very stinky. Not the place you want to be. But trust it in Jesus. He promises eternal life. He promises heaven. He promises problem-free life. And you're going to live forever. Yeah, going to live forever. And don't, and don't have to add nothing. You ain't got to do nothing with your hair, with your teeth, nothing. You're going to live forever just looking like you look. And just, I mean, forever and forever and forever. And you'll be in the presence of God eternally. Again, maybe you're already saved. You're not in a church. Here is what I want the last thing I want to say to you. If you're not in a church home, we would love you to be part of the Good Shepherd family. If God leads you this way to come and be part of our church family, it would be great for you to be a member of this congregation. There's some things that you have that we need. There's some things that you need that we have. God will allow us to work it all together. Amen. Amen. Won't you give the Lord Jesus a hand clap of praise one more time for his goodness, his greatness, and his...